everybody. Hello. How are you today? Hi, hey Josh. All right. Another packed day. It seems like they just keep getting busier and busier. Um, so I want to start by telling you a little bit about a, uh, a terrific dialogue and engagement that we held today earlier, earlier today at the State Department. Uh, Secretary Rex Tillerson and the Chinese Vice Premier Liao Den Yen Dong chaired the first U.S.-China social and cultural dialogue here at the State Department today. That dialogue focused on advancing cooperation in seven areas, education, social development, science and technology, health, subnational, arts and culture, and environment and conservation. The two sides committed to safeguarding global health security and support for educational exchanges, particularly the U.S.-China Fulbright program. The Secretary advocated for access of foreign media to Chinese audiences. Later today, Secretary Tillerson will travel to China to meet with Foreign Minister Wang Yi, the State Councilor Yang Jiechi, pardon me, and President uh, Xi Jinping. The, uh, the Secretary will discuss a range of issues focusing on the President's planned travel to the region, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, also trade and investment. In addition to that, um, this is building on Secretary of Commerce's Ross's uh, visit earlier this week. We're working with China to rebalance our trade and our lopsided relationship in that realm and ensure that China provides fair treatment to U.S. companies in ways that create U.S. jobs. Secretary Tillerson's visit to China reaffirms the administration's commitment to further broaden and enhance U.S. economic and security interests in the Asia-Pacific region. On Wednesday, the, the direction of Secretary Tillerson, Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan, they will host the Law Enforcement and Cybersecurity Dialogue. That's next week. It will be co-chaired by Attorney General Jeff Sessions and Acting Secretary of Homeland Security Elaine Duke on the U.S. side and State Counselor and Minister of Public Security Guo Shun Kun on the Chinese side. They will talk about increasing cooperation on repatriations, fugitives, counter-narcotics, and also cybercrime. With the conclusion of the Law Enforcement Cybersecurity Dialogue, the first round of the four Cabinet-level dialogues agreed to by President Trump and President Xi at Mar-a-Lago in April will have been completed. The Diplomatic and Security Dialogue and the Comprehensive Economic Dialogue were held in June and July, respectively. That was a mouthful. <laughs> uh, so we were very happy to have welcomed them today. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I wanted to mention something about uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, today. We have seen uh, some false reporting coming out from uh, some members of the news media today, so I wanted to take a uh, moment to clarify things. Reports that the State Department is evacuating U.S. citizens and charging Puerto Ricans for evacuation flights are false. The State Department is not facilitating evacuations from Puerto Rico. Reports that the State Department is confiscating U.S. passports of Puerto Ricans is also false. Let's go back to geography class, folks. Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. Here at the State Department, we work with uh, international countries, and therefore we are not involved in this. Uh, State Department is not an agency in charge of relief efforts there, and for questions about relief efforts in Puerto Rico, I would refer you to FEMA. They have the lead on this. I'd also like to thank uh, those of you who called us to check the facts earlier today. We received phone calls, so uh, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, we are always happy to help track those down and try to get you the information on a timely basis. So thank you very much. And with that, I will take your questions. Uh, just, uh, just on that, um, yeah. when, you, when you do, when you are uh, part of an evacuation from a foreign country, people do have to reimburse the government for their flights, don't they? I mean, that's always been in, the case in, in the in past. Some, it since, hasn't changed, has it? Yeah, since 1956, when we have assisted with the evacuations, and that's not you know, that's not something that happens all the time, but when the State Department has assisted with evacuations, we are required by law, again, this does not pertain to Puerto Rico, but in the past instances with Irma, for example, uh, we would then uh, seek reimbursement to the max maximum extent practicable for evacuation services provided to private U.S. citizens. There are some times when we do not do that. 
Uh, an example of that would be there was a certain window of time during two hurricanes from St. Martin, and that is when the secretary waived those fees. So Americans were not asked to pay those fees uh, in that particular incident. We were trying to get as many people out as quickly as possible in between two storms. But I want to assure you that no one will be denied assistance because they cannot produce a checkbook or a credit card. Again, this only applies to uh, international places. Well, right. So, but in the, and, and in those cases, do they have to actually surrender a passport? Not to my not to my knowledge. I've never heard of surrendering a passport. Okay, I'm getting the nod now. Okay. No. Okay. Yes. So are you saying that people in Puerto Rico are not even being asked to sign these promissory notes and they're not I, I asked, or speak, just that state is not I can only speak to the State Department. Uh, in terms of the State Department, the State Department, and I want to be clear, is not evacuating anyone from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. Uh, FEMA may be doing other things, and if you have any questions about that, then I would refer you to FEMA. Okay? Right. So can we move to um, uh, um, – where do I want to go? Oh, right, Cuba. Um, is, yes. Do you have any update on the um, review of what to do about the embassy or your staffing levels there and um, anything more on the investigation into the incidents? Sure. Uh, as many of you know, we met uh, earlier this week with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and his delegation here at the State Department. That was a meeting that was held at their request. We were more than happy to have that meeting and to be able to ask questions and have a dialogue with the Cuban delegation. Uh, I would describe the conversation between Secretary Tillerson and his counterparts as firm and frank. The Secretary continued to express his profound concern for Americans who are employed by the U.S. Embassy in Havana. Many of you have had questions in recent days about the timing of any potential announcements uh, in terms of whether or not we change staffing levels or whatever. Uh, I just want to let you know that the Secretary is reviewing all of his options. Uh, we are reviewing how to best protect our American personnel. In terms of the investigation, the FBI has the lead on that investigation. We have a lot of conversations and dialogue with uh, the FBI and other agencies that are a part of this investigation, and that has not been concluded just yet. Uh, one other note, I just want to let you know that the Secretary has been monitoring this very closely. We have had a lot of meetings here at the State Department from ver with various bureaus and people weighing in of the safety and security of our folks who are serving the United States down there is our top concern. So uh, related, just related to yes. that, it seems to have crept into some, some, some kind of <laughs> conventional wisdom that, that, that you ha are now at, uh, have, de have determined that 25 Americans were, instead of the 21, which you have repeatedly confirmed and denied the 25, and yet the 25 continues to appear in a variety of reports. It does. Is there a reason for that, is it, or is it, uh, is it still wrong? Here's what, I, here's what I can tell you. We have had, and I want to be clear about this as well, 21 medically confirmed cases. We have always been clear about saying that number could certainly change. We have people who are undergoing medical evaluations. People's symptoms um, have changed, and some of them are different uh, from one another. So they continue to undergo medical evaluations. I certainly hope that no one else is uh, diagnosed, for lack of a better word, um, uh, by the medical community. We certainly hope that that won't be the case, but if that changes, I've always been very forthcoming in bringing you uh, the numbers as we get them, as we can confirm them. La la last one, just yeah. to put a fight. Just to put a fight. Well, hold on. This is on that point. Okay. So right now, yes. all you can confirm is 21. Correct. 25 figure that's out there is I have just no wrong. idea. I have no idea where the number 25 wrong, came right? from. All of the briefings I have sat in with our top people have all indicated 21 is the number. However, that number could certainly change as we continue to evaluate our U.S. staff who serve down there. 21 diagnosed cases. 21 medically confirmed. Confirmed incidents related to this sonic. That they've experienced. I'm, I'm not characterizing it that way. That's your word. That's m not mine. 21 medically confirmed to have experienced health effects. Directly what? related to the same specific. We don't, we don't know what it was. We don't know who's done it. We've been no, very but, but clear I'm about that from the beginning. I'm saying, like, there could be more than 21 people who have reported kind of health symptoms that you believe are unrelated. At least but I, when you say let, 21, do you mean they're all related to the same? There are a lot of questions that we still have. That's why we have such a vigorous investigation that is underway. 
we have the best medical professionals here on the mainland ha helping our people and helping with the evaluations. Those evaluations are ongoing, last I had heard, which was just a few hours ago. 21 people have been medically confirmed to have experienced health effects. Okay? Yeah, well, why two months uh, since it's been? This has been reported for the past two months and so on. Why does it remain such a mystery? And uh, since this was your first meeting with the foreign minister of Cuba, mm -hmm. did they in any way explain what's going on, or did they come clean? How, how did they respond? I, I wish I could get. Issues? I wish I could get into some of that conversation with you. Un unfortunately, I cannot. Um, we had the conversation with them. We made it very clear. Cuba has a responsibility, as does every country that hosts. Uh, U.S. and other officials where we have posts. They have a responsibility to ensure that our embassy personnel are kept safe. That's under the Vienna Convention. That obviously was not done. Our people um, are, were certainly put in a very precarious situation. And let me again just say, the safety and security of our folks is our top concern. Anything else on Cuba? So it sounds, Go ahead. Go ahead. It sounds like shocked. in the investigation and in terms of you leaning even one way or another as to what this was. Was it an, an attack or not? You know, who did it? It doesn't sound <laughs> like it's moved in any way. I, or I can't say that. I, I cannot speak to the investigation. I cannot speak to the details of the investigation. I'm not one of the investigators. That is held, uh, handled by a separate agency, separate group of folks, so I'm not able to answer your questions about that. And even if I did have the answers to that, I probably wouldn't be able to bring it to you because we don't know who is responsible, we don't know what is responsible. We want to bring in all the facts and have those facts sussed out before I can bring it to anybody. But okay. there's, I mean, you must have concerns that this could have, because you don't know what this was even mm -hmm. or who did this, this could, potentially happen to any diplomat anywhere. We have never seen this any place in the world before. Uh, as far as we know, this is uh, just something that's limited to Cuba. Heather, can um, you said people were, were put in danger? Past tense. Um, are you sure that the incidents have stopped? The last, the last incident that has been reported was in August. And okay. I know none since then, but are you confident that there will be no more future incidents? I would, goodness, I would certainly hope not. I would certainly hope not. Um, but you can't rule that out. We are, we are working hard to try to get to the bottom of this. Uh, we've tried to extend every possible assistance available to our people who are amazingly serving, over, serving in Cuba uh, despite the situation. And frankly, a lot of our folks really want to be down there. Um, they are happy and proud of the work that they're doing. And despite these concerns, our folks are still doing their jobs every day. I'm just wondering if, if you know, people still want to work down there and yeah. serve down there, and you're not aware of any future, you know, well, obviously not aware of any future instance, no idea what's what's really happening. But what what is drawing down the diplomatic presence achieve? I, I have, there is, I don't have anything to announce for you on that, okay? And if that changes, I will let you know. Based on this last high-level conversation, you're still calling this an incident, right? It's, I it's, do. it's yeah. not appropriate to call it an attack, or is it? Look, I prefer to call it an incident because we still do not know what the cause was, and we don't know who's responsible for it. Can you tell us anything about the investigation, like how many FBI agents Did may you just be down walk in there? Here? Michelle just asked me that same question. Oh, <laughs> about the investigation. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Carol. I miss her. <laughs> no, the answer is no. I can't tell you anything about the investigation. Okay. okay. If I can, I'll certainly bring it to you. Hello, okay. Go ahead. Hi, Josh. I was asking about. Can you can you offer any insight into what criteria the State Department is using to determine if a, a diplomat in Havana comes forward and says, you know, I have, I have a headache, mm -hmm. um, whether that is a medically confirmed incident versus just a headache or an unrelated physical ailment? We have, when I say we have top medical staff, people, not staff working for us, but people elsewhere uh, who are involved in this um, at different medical facilities in the United States. In addition, we have a medical representative there on the ground in Cuba who's there 24-7. We also have a bureau here that's our medical bureau. So they're all involved in tracking this um, in terms of the kinds of tests that people are going. I just can't speak. I can't speak to that part. You know, if you, given that you don't know what is causing this, how could it be that you could medically confirm that these cases are or are not related? I, I think that's a question for uh, the medical staff, and a lot of that would just be confidential. I'm sorry, I don't have anything for you on that. Okay. The foreign minister. Yes. Um, the Cuban government called this meeting. Uh, it was scheduled, I believe, for a half hour. It went much longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, 
why did they say they scheduled the meeting? Did they come with information? Did they come trying to avoid any type of U.S. reprisals to insist that they weren't doing anything? I, I don't, I don't want to ascribe any motivations uh, to that. Uh, their request for the meeting. Uh, we have had conversations with them on the ground in Cuba, and I know they were heading back to Cuba from New York from having been at the United Nations, and so they stopped down here to have a conversation with us. And they're investigating this in conjunction with the Well, NBA look, I, any country would have to basically sign off on U.S. investigators being on the ground. So when I've talked about their cooperation, they, you know, gave us and our investigators the permission to head to that country to conduct investigations. Okay? So let's – let's – yesterday further that cooperation or did it kind of put make it harder to I'm, continue I'm not going to characterize that I'm just going to say the meeting was frank and firm and we had a, uh, a it was good to have a chat okay yes that, yeah uh, let's move on from Cuba I don't have yeah, anything more put, for put, you put, on put, Cuba put, as I have more information for you on Cuba I will bring it can to we just you get okay reaction to one there was one report that said the US had ruled out that Cuba was responsible can you confirm or deny that when I say that the investigation is ongoing so you haven't the ruled investigation out. is ongoing okay let me Thank leave you. it at that okay yeah, let's right. move on okay let's move yeah. on to Iraq uh, you know a couple of days after that Kurdistan referendum uh, the relations between Baghdad and Erbil is getting complicated, as you and many others expected. Uh, Kurdistan now is almost besieged by Turkey, uh, Iran, and Iraq. And th there is a feeling among the people in Kurdistan that the United States is keeping silent, and that means gr giving the green light to Iraq to do whatever they want to do. Uh, keeping silent would yeah. be a uh, mischaracterization of the U.S. position on this. We have been very clear from the beginning that we opposed that referendum because we thought it would be destabilizing. As we see some of these reports in the media, unfortunately, that has been borne out. This is destabilizing. We want uh, Kurdistan, we want the, the Kurds, we want Iraq, the central government of Iraq, to remain focused on the fight against ISIS. We have uh, concerns that this will take the focus off the fight against ISIS. That being said, I want to be very cautious about inflaming tensions. We understand uh, the concerns that many in the region have, and the United States government doesn't want to do anything to inflame tensions in that arena. We want to avoid anything that would contribute to any additional instability. So you are not part of any dialogue currently between uh, uh, Baghdad and Erbil. So there's no dialogue, but are you not working well, on We've had lots of conversations, uh, both with Erbil and with Baghdad as well. The sec the Secretary had conversations with uh, both of his counterparts over the past few days. I have said this, and we've talked about this, you and I talked about this, right? The United States, if asked, would be willing to help facilitate a conversation between the two. But I want to be clear about that, if asked. If we are asked to assist in any way, look, we're friends with the Kurds, we are friends with the central government of Iraq. Uh, we have fought, our American forces have fought side by side with your folks, okay? We want to have a stable, unified Iraq. We want that more than anything. We want ISIS out of Iraq. We want to see them decimated and to never wreak terror on your communities again. Uh, one more thing on that, yes. that's just the Iraqi government, uh, it's, it seems that the par parliament asking the Iraqi government to ask the, all of the foreign uh, consulates and representatives in Erbil to close. Have you received any warning or any message from the Iraqi government to close your embassy? Our, our embassy remain, our consulate rather, in, um, in Erbil remains open. Okay, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any requests in part of, okay, hold on, hold on, hi Lise. Will you, um, okay, so you said that this was a destabilizing vote, yeah. you don't agree with it. Does that mean that you will not recognize an independent Kurdistan? That would be a hypothetical situation. Why? If you, if you didn't think it was a good idea for them to vote on independence, yeah. then our, how Our relationship mean? with uh, the Kurds, in our view, will not change. Would you like okay. to see their friends in Malakai? I don't know that that's, I don't know that that's a, doable? I'm not familiar with the, with the law or the specifics under which this was, was held, so I'm hesitant to you know, get into that kind of a hypothetical. You said that the Secretary okay. has talked to Iraq and Kurdistan. Was that yes. after the referendum or before? Uh, in the days before. I'm not aware if he's had any conversations with them since, and he's now on his way to Beijing. And do, do, don't you have any um, um, reaction to 
uh, what Kurdistan uh, considers a collective punishment, uh, mm. uh, the, the, um, the, the suspension of the flights. Uh, almost all the airlines have canceled their flights for tomorrow. And uh, we have actually learned from sources within Iran. Our network has learned from sources within Iran and Turkey that Iran and Iraq are trying, maybe tonight, to take the border crossings by force. Isn't the United States really doing anything? We would oppose. What seems... We would oppose any violence if that were to take place. We uh, want to be very strongly. Um, our voice. We hope our voices will be heard in a in a very strong fashion that we oppose violence on any side of this. Mm -hmm. Just one more question. Uh, Turkey, the Turkish government has taken a number of Kurdish stations of air, including Rudal, like uh, our network. Are, are you concerned about this decision by the Turkish government? I, I'm not aware of that. This is the first I've heard of it. So uh, we can certainly look into it and see if I can get you anything on that, okay? Look, Hi, Lori. Former ambassador to Iraq, Ryan Crocker, said today on CNN it was a mistake for the U.S. to come down so hard against the referendum once it was clear it was going to happen and that it probably emboldened Baghdad to take a harsher posture than it, than it otherwise would have. And he also stressed the importance of managing the tensions that now exist in the mm -hmm. region. What is your response to that? I, the only thing I will respond to, and I'm always hesitant to respond to uh, other officials or uh, world leaders uh, who specifically have a comment or an opinion on something, but he does bring up that last point is, uh, is a valid one, and that is, we would like to see some calm on all sides. The United States does not want to do anything that would inflame tensions. That's why I'm going to be very cautious with my words. Uh, we will continue to uh, offer our assistance to help facilitate any dialogue if we are asked. But okay? if we are asked, you have influence in Baghdad, you have influence in Erbil, influence in Ankara. Crocker stressed the importance of the U.S. being proactive on this. I, I think we have been very proactive. We've talked about Iraq and we've talked about this referendum a lot from this briefing room. Okay, let's uh, move on. One let's more. move on. Okay, one more in Iraq. Go ahead. Uh, has the State Department got any response to this apparent message from him, the fact that he's still standing at this point? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, the, uh, the that tape that was released that is allegedly of Baghdad. I'm certainly aware of that tape. Uh, we have folks who will take a look at it. Uh, when I say we, I don't necessarily mean the State Department. Somebody out there in the U.S. government is taking a look or a listen at that tape to uh, try to confirm its authenticity. I'm not in the position to confirm the authenticity of that. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, okay. Are we good? Anything? Okay. Um, Ambassador David Friedman uh, in uh, Israel gave an interview in which he said that uh, only 2 percent of the West Bank is occupied. Mm -hmm. uh, does that reflect uh, the U.S. position? So I also heard about this report. And uh, when you mentioned that figure of 2 percent, I don't know where that came from. That came from some report. I have no idea which report that came from. It came from his, it came from his it was oh, from David okay. Friedman's mouth. Okay. I thought he was citing a report or something. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm aware of what he said, um, his comments, and I want to be crystal clear about this, should not be read as a, uh, a way to prejudge the outcome of any negotiations that the U.S. would have with the Israelis and the Palestinians, it should also not indicate a shift in U.S. policy. Well, do they reflect, oh, so, it does, so his comments by the U.S. Ambassador to Israel do not reflect U.S. policy? I just want to say it should not be read as a change in U.S. policy. Is you know, so so yeah. is this, uh, yeah, this is at least the second time that from the, this podium you've had to sort of clean up Ambassador Friedman's remarks. We had the alleged occupation. Is this becoming an issue? I mean, even if it's not a change of position, is the perception that the ambassador to Israel has his thumb on the scale and the, the view of this this uh, conflict uh, creating problems? I guess I guess what I would say to that is um, we have uh, some very effective uh, leaders and representatives for the U.S. government, including Jason Greenblatt, uh, Mr. Kushner, who are spending an awful lot of time in the region trying to uh, get both sides together to have talks about uh, you know. Uh, a lasting existence side by side. Um, the President has made that one of his top priorities. And when we talk about top priorities here, we talk about the nuclear threat of North Korea, 
but also uh, the nuclear and ballistic missile threat of North Korea. But we also talk about this. Um, and I think it indicates just how important this is to the President that he has put those two in charge of negotiating that. Um, in terms of the Ambassador, I can't comment any more for you on that other than to say our policy here has not changed. Well, it's not to me like you're saying, don't, you're, you're, telling, you're telling the Palestinians and the Israelis don't bother listening to the Ambassador or listen to, to the Greenblatt and, I, and Kushner. I've not, I've not had the chance to speak to the Ambassador, so I, you know, I, I will hesitate I mean, at commenting too spoke. much, hold on, too much on what he said. I was not there. I've not Fair heard enough. it. I've not heard the context in which that conversation was had. But I just want to be clear that our policy has not changed. Right. But, the, but, I mean, all that is fair enough. But the problem arises because he is the Senate-confirmed ambassador. Mr. Uh, neither Greenblatt nor Kushner mm -hmm. are. Uh, they're just kind of, you know, informal type envoys. And the um, ambassadors to every country are supposed to speak for and with the authority of, of, of the President of the United States. Do you not see that this is causing um, confusion? And then as a purely factual matter, how much of what percent of the West Bank does the United does the administration believe is occupied? I, I don't know that we have a map of that or that we have You've got a lot of maps. Do we have a lot of maps? Oh, do we? Okay, well see you all predate me here. I'll 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 go pull out some uh, the dusty many, shelves. Many, 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 many Okay, maps. okay, Saeed, go right ahead. On something else. Yes. He said. he said that the two state solution has lost its meaning. Is that your position? I, I mean this is you know, it's been the case of past US president I mean US uh, ambassadors in Israel to speak for the State Department and mm. to report directly to the Secretary of State. I, Has he cleared that with I the Secretary under, of State? I understand. Uh, the Secretary is on a plane right mm. now. I saw him earlier this morning at the mm. China Dialogue. I've not had a chance to talk with him about this. Can we go okay. back to yeah. um, Ambassador Friedman's current I, comments? At least I'm not going to have anything more for okay, you but on, on you the Ambassador. I understand, but you just said that, you know, Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner are working on this mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And then you said, or, or but before that, you said that Ambassador Friedman's comments don't reflect a change in policy. Mm -hmm. So aren't you a bit concerned that the ambassador's comments are detracting or going to harm the efforts by the president's appointed envoys on this issue? I, I think I would go back to the meetings that the president held uh, where the secretary was last week at, at the UN and meeting with Mr. Mbass and meeting with Mr. Netanyahu. And I think they know, I know they know, just how strongly we feel about trying to bring peace uh, peace to that region. Oh, well, they t the president told him and, that, that last week, and they, yes, they came across, they came out of those meetings And we last both came week, out of those meetings week, very, very hopeful. I understand And that. they both had said something along the lines of, we have, something along the lines of we've never felt like we we're in a better position to reach this goal. So I'm not going to, you know, tarnish that in any kind of way. Um, I think we're still going forward with that goal. But, but that was last week. And this week, the ambassador is coming out and saying something completely different. Well, Has he let me just say, to my knowledge, we have not received any phone calls uh, about this just yet. Okay. Saeed, go ahead. Very go right quickly, ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to follow up because today the Prime Minister of Israel uh, told the, the official uh, news channel uh, that he discussed with Mr. Greenblatt and with uh, Mr. Friedman and, in fact, with Mr. Uh, Dermer, the ambassador, the, uh, the Israeli uh -huh. ambassador uh -huh. here, that uh, they, uh, uh, they, you know, uh, they want to close, he, he raised with them closing the PLO embassy here in Washington. Uh -huh. you have anything on that? Yeah, do you know anything about that? Because I, I told the, the, the Palestinian ambassador, he said, we have, not, we have not heard anything. This is something that the Israelis are. Is saying they're doing. Do you okay. know anything I, about that? You know what? I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that report. If I have anything for you on it, I will certainly get it to you. But I could refer you back to the government. Uh, okay. related, Madam, do you yes. Have anything about Interpol um, recognizing or accepting Palestine as I a do. state? I do. I um, do. We're still working through some of that to try to figure out. You know, assess the situation on that. Uh, that vote took place earlier this week. Uh, we were disappointed in the vote. Uh, it grants Palestinian Authority country status in Interpol. We believe that that vote unnecessary polit unnecessarily politicizes the important law enforcement body. Uh, we believe it also complicates efforts to achieve a historic conflict ending agreement between the parties. I thought that this, the President's personal and the, his administration's primary goal um, in the Middle East is the defeat of ISIS and counterterrorism type things. This is one of Interpol's main functions. Are you saying mm -hmm. that you're disappointed that now 
the Palestinians will be able to participate fully in the work of an international police agency who, which is dedicated, uh, one of its primary missions, to fighting terrorism? No. Uh, fighting terrorism has not changed. That will not — that certainly will not change. So the Palestinians this can do it. Is, they just this, can't do but, it as but part this of the is, this is something by um, joining or uh, belonging to some of these international organizations uh, unnecessarily, we believe, complicates uh, peace between the two. And I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. All right. Shall we move on? Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, uh, Prime Minister Abe announced earlier that uh, Japan will hold snap elections next month. Uh, do you have any reaction, and will this affect the president's trip to Asia um, in a couple of months from now? Sure. So I, I, I don't think it will uh, affect the president's trip to Asia. Uh, I don't have a full schedule uh, for the president. I know he will be traveling to China. What countries beyond that, I, I just don't know. I know the president is really looking forward to that. We had a terrific uh, meetings, series of meetings here today with the Chinese delegation. Uh, to your question about Japan and the SNAP elections, um, we would regard that as internal politics. So I'm not going to comment on that too much. I can just say that Japan will always remain a steadfast ally of ours. Our relationship, we've talked about this before one-on-one, -on -one, our relationship with the Japanese is one that we consider to be ironclad. And then okay. on the Secretary's trip to Beijing mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, is there any action in particular that you'll be requesting from uh, his counterparts in Beijing? And can you offer any insight on the schedule? Let's see. I don't have the exact schedule in front of me. I'm sorry. I just don't, did not grab that. You might think so with this big book, <laughs> but I don't have the Secretary's schedule. Um, I know that he is um, really looking forward to that. Um, if I can just, you know, bend your ear for a moment on the, um, the dialogue that we had today. It was terrific to have met so many foreign ministers uh, – so, excuse me, so many cabinet-level officials uh, from China. Uh, we met with the education minister, the finance minister, uh, the equivalent of our health and human services secretary, and they were all here for a bunch of meetings uh, with their various counterparts to talk about different forms of dialogue. This is one of the four meetings that the President, uh, President Trump and, uh, and, and Mr. Xi had agreed to earlier this year. So it was a terrific exchange of ideas about how the United States can um, perhaps bring in more of their students. Uh, there are so many uh, students who are coming from China every year. I know that the Secretary looks to just reinforce the relationship with China. As two massive powers, massive populations, we want to have a good understanding uh, and a good working relationship with China. Today was a part of that. Uh, the Secretary's trip, uh, where he's, uh, you know, will land uh, later today or tomorrow, is a continuation of that. Part of what he will be doing on that trip is helping to uh, facilitate the President's travel and talk about what the President will be doing when the President arrives there. That he'll be bringing on North Korea to China? Oh, well, I mean, that is certainly a, a big topic of conversation that we always have. Uh, I know that the Secretary will continue his conversations uh, with the Chinese government about the destabilizing activities of the DPRK. Uh, China has taken some great strides in recent weeks. Uh, and we look forward to China adhering to the UN Security Council resolutions and fully implementing all those resolutions. We've seen some reports today about how they have committed to do just that. And so I think the Secretary will be thanking them uh, for the steps that they've taken in that direction. And of course, we're always looking for countries to do more. Okay. Yeah. And your opening spiel on the dialogue from this morning at the top, yeah. you mentioned one line was about how he talked about hoping the Chinese would increase access to foreign media yes. uh, for Chinese audiences. Mm -hmm. was, he, was he any more specific about, like, which foreign media? And, uh, uh, so uh, I, was, I was there and uh, heard the Secretary as he was, uh, as he was talking about that, and, and, and you know uh, freedom of speech is an important matter uh, for the U.S. government. It's, it's what we stand for. It's one of the things we care about most deeply. The subject came up. The Secretary brought up that issue and said that that was a um, – I'm trying to think of his exact words. I don't have them in front of me, but where he said, you know, that we would like further – and I can check my notes – but we'd like further access um, because that – having access to U.S. media could help better uh, – help the two countries better understand one another. Okay. Can I just make the point that one way to demonstrate your commitment to yes. uh, freedom of press and the importance of it is actually bringing more reporters with him on his trip when he shows up? 
I will register that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything? Anything else on um, on on North Korea, China? On North Korea. Okay. Hi. Um, does the United States have any indication, or will the United States be pushing <laughs> for China to go beyond what it's agreed to in Security Council resolutions? Is there an indication that China might well, go for it? I, I don't want to speak on behalf of um, Nikki Haley and her very, very capable team up there. Um, I don't know what they have in mind. If there are further sanctions at the United Nations that the Security Council could undertake, um, we've been pleased that we've had two unanimous UN Security Council resolutions that have been beyond without an additional resolution. Without an oh, additional resolution, we're always asking countries uh, to do more. We're always asking countries to do more. China has um, said that they are implementing and adhering to uh, the UN Security Council resolutions, and so we're, we're obviously very pleased with that, but we're always asking every country to do more. We know a lot of countries can do more. Uh, we just had a, a good headline out of Malaysia today. Malaysia is uh, eliminating its, uh, my understanding, of, I hope I'm phrasing this properly, but their, um, the North Korea embassy staff, essentially. Can you can you say? Excuse, excuse me, sir. Sorry, sorry. Um, how does the State Department view this um, discussion that's going to go on tomorrow between North Korea and Russia? Mm. And are is the U.S. speaking to Russia about these talks before they happen? Well, uh, you may recall about two weeks ago or so, our ambassador Joe Yoon had traveled to Moscow to meet with some Russian officials. And Ambassador Yoon spoke with them uh, specifically about North Korea. Uh, if you recall, uh, Russia was one of the countries that signed on to both of those unanimous UN Security Council resolutions. We were pleased to see that. Um, you mentioned the issue of uh, DPRK traveling to Moscow, apparently, for some meetings there. You know, I can't see that as a bad thing. Diplomacy is our preferred approach. Uh, if uh, Russia can be successful in getting North Korea to to move in a better direction, we would certainly welcome that. And um, North Korea responded in sort of classic form to these allegations that Otto Warmbier has been tortured. Yeah. Now, I know you say you don't want to disrespect the parents or violate mm -hmm. privacy in talking about the State Department's view of this case and yeah. Warmbier's treatment, but they are the ones out there I saying know. that. I know. So. By leaving it out there and having North Korea furiously respond, and the president had tweeted it, um, isn't that just exacerbating the situation? If the State Department does not believe he was tortured, I, I didn't say that. I have only said that we're not going to comment on uh, what may or may not have happened to him. And and why and, is that? Because obviously the privacy issue is off the table since the parents are the ones talking about it. I, I think we uh, try our very best not to talk about people's health concerns, health situations, health status. Uh, we try to be strong and clear about that, and so I'm not going to do that. Look, his parents are in terrible mourning. We did everything we could to bring their son home, um, some pretty heroic efforts on the part of our staff. We were all incredibly heartbroken um, when he was brought home and we learned about his fate, certainly. Uh, but I'm, I'm just not, I'm not going to comment on that. I know you'd like me to, but I'm not going to comment on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Marchin, how are you? Uh, Heather, uh, I have a question about uh, the judicial uh, reform in Poland. Uh, you said about two months ago that you're watching the situation there closely, and the president of Poland this week uh, proposed two bills mm -hmm. uh, written by his administration. So uh, do you have any comment about that? Yeah, well, uh, we certainly do. So we, we've been watching uh, the situation unfold in, in, in Poland very closely. Uh, Poland, of course, a, uh, an important uh, friend of the United States. Uh, we believe that a healthy and strong democracy in Poland is a vital component of U.S.-Polish relations. Uh, you all well know there are a lot of Poles who live here in the United States. I grew up with a lot of Polish families where I'm from in the Midwest. Uh, we have expressed our concerns uh, about the rule of law and the developments there in Poland. I want to be clear about that. Poland has every right to enact judicial reform, but reforms should be in line with Poland's constitution and the highest standards of international law. It should also respect judicial independence and the separation of powers. Uh, we are aware that President Duda's uh, new judicial reform proposals uh, 
we are closely following the Parliament's upcoming deliberations on them. I don't have the date for them, but I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Uh, we rely on our allies to maintain strong democratic institutions, economies, and also defense capabilities. We'll continue to watch that very carefully, but just want to express how important it is to have a strong and healthy democracy in Poland. Just to go back Thanks. to China here, can we not leave that topic yet? Well, a actually, um, in the meeting, we, to, I think in we, the meeting we've today, out, we've closed out on China. No, so. on the meeting today, uh, the initial reports were that uh, Secretary Chow was also going to be a part of this, but as oh. I understand it was Secretary Tillerson, Secretary DeVos, were there any other high-level representatives from the U.S. Side. I don't have the full schedule on uh, what took place. I believe that my understanding is that Secretary Chow was meeting with them later today. When exactly, I don't know. I would just have to refer you to her department for that, okay? But uh, Secretary DeVos was here and, of course, Secretary Tillerson as well. Uh, hi, Ilhan. How are you? Uh, Turkey today, President Erdogan once more talk about American pastor who has been mm -hmm jailed in Turkey almost a year, Amer uh, Branson, and President Erdogan said, suggested openly that there should be a, some kind of swap between the Fethullah Gülen, who is Turkish national and lives in the U.S., and the American pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your view on uh, this? In terms of Fethullah Gülen, uh, who is here in the United States, we have received several requests for his extradition. Uh, from the Turkish government uh, related to him. Though that is something, I, we haven't talked about this for a while, we continue to evaluate it, take a look at it, the materials that the Turkish government has provided us. I don't have anything new for you on the subject of that. In terms of Pastor Brunson, that is a very important issue for us, to try to get Pastor Brunson home. It is something that the President uh, had raised uh, with uh, Mr. Erdogan not, not too terribly long ago. Uh, the State Department has been in um, as close of contact as, as we can be uh, with Pastor uh, Brunson. We last were able to visit him on September the 18th. That's a new uh, bit of news. Uh, the last time that we had visited him uh, was, uh, let's see, it was uh, August the 24th. And we just, we continue to advocate for his release. Um, he was wrongfully imprisoned in Turkey, and we'd like to see him brought home. Just one more question. Yeah. We don't usually hear this kind of uh, prisoner swap or hostage diplomacy between the allies, Turkey's ally. We hear about Iran or North Korea. Uh, what's the, your view that this kind of offer coming from your ally? Look, I, I, I can't imagine that we would go down that road. Um, we have received extradition requests for him. I have nothing new for you on that. We continue to call for Pastor Brunson's release. Okay, we've got to wrap All it up right. there. Uh, hold on. No one from this administration has yet spoken on the record about the refugee numbers. So I want to ask you oh, about that, but okay. I also want to ask you, can you take the question about what percentage of the West Bank the administration sees as occupied? I will I will see if I can there are find plenty, something for you on that. Nuts. I will see if I can find something for you on that. Matt, that may be a situation where there are different reports that have different information, and so okay. well, that are, I'm just... That there's works. one thing that there is not a shortage of in this area. It's okay. maps. Okay. Um, on the uh, on the refugee. Yes. Numbers, um, if you look at the, like, the last 40 years the, um, of of refugee admissions, or mm -hmm. since 1975, essentially. You, since you, you started reporting, you notice, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Ooh, teasing. Ooh, <laughs> ouch. I'm just teasing. Not that know. old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Whenever, historically, there's, there's a trend that whenever whenever there is a bump in the number of refugees mm -hmm. worldwide, um, the the number of the admissions numbers of the United States have, have gone up. This has been true in the late 70s and 80s with the Vietnamese and Cambodians, mm -hmm. and then again the, with the Soviet Union and the fall of the Soviet Union, the numbers shoot up. You can see it in the in the way in, <clears throat> in the in the stats that you guys have. Uh, compiled, and then again with the Iraq War, the, num the number of refugees worldwide went up mm -hmm. because of them, and your numbers went up. And then again with Syria. Did you get uh, a map there? No, I don't have a map. You I just have the, I have the charts okay. of the, the figures. So, is this administration comfortable for the first time being the first being the first administration, Republican or Democrat, because there were Republican administrations that bumped this up um, as well? Is this administration comfortable actually reducing? the number, uh, the cap, when 
the refugee uh, situation worldwide is the worst that it has been since the Second World War. When it comes to refugees, uh, we have a couple different ways of handling a refugee population. I've spent a lot of time with our, uh, our bureau that handles that, our Refugee and Migration Bureau. Um, those folks have been here for many years and are, are dedicated to what they do, and they do a terrific job. Um, one of the things they said to me, the very first briefing I had with them when I came into this position, was they explained to me that refugees by and large, well, refugees, not by and large, but this is a fact, uh, prefer to stay closer to home. Okay, we all may think as Americans that everybody wants to come here to the United States. But as a matter of fact, these refugees often want to stay closer to home so that it's when it's safe and practical for them to be able to return home to their communities they can. Uh, one place we are starting to see that trickle in, we talked to the government of Turkey last week, we are starting to see that in parts of Syria as places start to become safer. Of course, in Syria, that's a relative thing. But in general, people like to stay closer to home. The United States remains, when we bring people over here to the United States, the refugee population, and that's what you're talking about now, remains the uh, largest acceptor of refugees in the world. Uh, there are only about 37 countries across the world that accept refugees. How many countries are there in the world? 200? Close to 200? So we're one of 37 and we're the top. So we continue to bring in refugees. We have a very strong program that once refugees are brought into the United States, we, the United States, along with um, uh, partners and NGOs, uh, help facilitate their um, integration into their communities. I mentioned to you I grew up in Wisconsin. A lot of monks uh, came over in the 1970s and have established farms and still living there. So this Mom, is from Laos. Yes, or monks. Yeah, or both from Laos. Yeah, yeah. Um, and are still living there. And um, right, and they did not prefer to stay close to home, which is not really the point but of my question. That's my, a different. That's a different but situation. But by and large, is, people want to stay close to home so they can return my home when is, they're ready. The fact is that the United States has traditionally, has historically been a leader when the global population. We still are a leader in that, Matt. We still are a leader in that. We accept more refugees than any other country around the world. And when we accept those refugees, we provide them with services in the United States to help them out. We have a tremendous network of not just State Department officials, but also NGOs, church groups, the Lutherans up in Minnesota, um, who volunteer their time and effort to help these families. All of which is wonderful, Mike. That's not my question. Okay. The question is that traditionally, historically, when the global population of refugees has spiked, has gone up in these incident, incident, instances that I have mentioned here, the ex U.S. acceptance of the, the number admitted to the United States has also gone up because those administrations decided that it was important for the U.S. to take a leadership role, to bump its numbers up in acceptance, to get other countries to do the same. Look, I, is this administration comfortable not doing that in this case when we have a record level of Matt, you're wrapping, of, in, of you're wrapping in opinion into this question. The fact is we have are accepting so. uh, for fiscal year 2018 45,000, okay, 45,000 refugees coming from all around the world. Uh, we are assisting those families. It is something where we have come up with um, some more uh, stringent, if you will, uh, procedures for allowing people to come in. Having more stringent procedures for allowing people to come in, asking additional questions, that type of thing, requires uh, more work to vet those refugees. We feel, this government feels, that that is the number that we can practically bring here in the United States and handle. These people, one that, once they come in, will in fact be receiving more types of services, better types of services than those in the past. Additional English training is one example. Additional job services. So I would argue, in fact, that these refugees may in fact be better off with fewer refugees here in the United States than those in the past. Well, okay, that's an interesting way to look at it, I guess. Um, I, I'm not sure it's going to win you a lot of praise from the refugee advocate community. The, deficient, the, the discussion on the conference call that I was not able to be on yesterday was all about number one issue, safety and security mm -hmm. for the United mm -hmm. States and the fact that you need to increase the vetting of these people and that that can reduce the you know, that, that that makes sense that it would reduce the number you're able to take in. I'm curious, though, now, uh, months after as this review has gone in, gone on, what deficiencies did the administration discover 
uh, in the vet in the in the vetting process that was used by the previous by, See, by previous administrations. I, I would I would take issue with that as well because as um, technology changes, as uh, situations on the ground changes, we need to constantly be revamping our um, security procedures. Uh, and that is something our, our procedures are strong now, but we're always working to improve those procedures. We're starting to get in the territory of Department of Homeland Security. They have a, a great press staff, so they but can best answer that, those you questions. You don't think the previous administrations also did that and were able to were increase the number? Of course, of they were. I, I imagine they were constantly revising um, okay. their procedures. So what, what specifically was deficient about the previous the vetting process. Look, all I can say is that there are some new standards in place. There will be some new standards in place. I know that DHS is working on those. Details about that, I just have to refer so you to DHS. they don't know what they are yet? They're still being worked I, on? I, that, I, I don't want to speak for DHS, okay. so uh, on that part, I just I want to refer you to them. if they're still being worked on, I'd like to know how it is that you've determined that you can't take more than 45000 mm -hmm. if you don't know what they are yet. Okay. That's, all right. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all.